what I want to do is to pick out 12 days in the year running up to the EU referendum, which I think were crucial to our victory. You know, 12 key wins for the, the Leave side. Now, the key point that I want to make is that all of these wins, all of these days in isolation, um, couldn't have been done without a lot of long-term planning building up to um, you know, that event. So the thing I want to really stress is that Vote Leave's success and the Leave campaign's success wasn't just grounded in a well-run campaign in the six months running up to the referendum, but also in terms of days, years indeed, decades of activity running up to that. So what's the, uh, the first of the 12 days of Brexit? The first one I've picked out is the um, 7th of September um, 2015. And that was the day when the government was defeated on Perda. And this was a really important win for Vote Leave. It was before we were launched, but it was a win by um, Conservatives of Britain, which we set up um, shortly after the uh, general election. Now, as most of you probably know, Perda usually applies for um, about four weeks before any um, general election or referendum campaign. And it basically prevents the machinery of government from being used for political campaigning. And this covers everything from um, promotional material, from leaflets and websites, right through to um, official um, government reports. And the government had tried to amend the European Union referendum bill at the third re reading to actually relax the usual restrictions on this sort of uh, campaigning by the government. And this would have given the government, had they succeeded, free reign right up until referendum day to carry on using the full machinery of state to actually uh, you know, promote the Remain cause. And without PERDA, it would have been massively difficult for Vote Leave to have cut through in those final crucial four weeks of the campaign. Those crucial four weeks where actually Vote Leave started getting the momentum. Now, thanks to um, several well-organised Tory backbenchers, including Steve Baker and Bernard Jenkin and Bill Cash, they were able to organise a rebellion which made sure that Perda was reinstated into the referendum bill. And this was really the first big victory for Conservatives of Britain, and it was absolutely vital to a fair and balanced um, campaign. And it ended up meaning that Perda came in 28 days out before the referendum. Before Perda kicked in, Vote Leave was at a massive um, disadvantage. We really felt it as a campaign. Not just things like the um, £9.3 million spent on a government leaflet sent to every household and the online activity and online ads from the um, government, but also in terms of the reports put out by government departments, particularly the Treasury. Um, the ones warning of a severe economic shock if Britain voted leave. The ones talking about um, a self-inflicted recession. And of course the one promoting the notorious 4,300 costs of Brexit per household figure. All of these made it very difficult for Vote Leave to actually cut through. Because whenever we did anything um, good in promotional terms, um, the government would step in with a new report to actually cut off the, uh, the headlines we were due to get that um, evening. And I think it's fair to say that without Perda, Vote Leave probably wouldn't have won the referendum. And I think the long-term um, win for us in this, the reason why we won, was because all of the activity by Conservative MPs over many, many years, they were well organised and they were able to mo motivate and organise backbench Conservatives to rebel on key points like that. The second day I've picked up is um, the election of um, Jeremy Corbyn on the 12th of September um, 2015. And the election of a veteran Eurosceptic backbencher um, as Labour leader turned out to be a massively good day for vote leave. Now, not only had he voted to leave the um, EEC in 1975, He'd voted against the Maastricht Treaty in 1993, um, criticising it as taking power away from national parliaments 
and handing it over to an unelected set of bankers. He would voted against the Lisbon Treaty in 2008. Um, he described the EU's treatment of Greece as brutal during the leadership campaign, and he refused to even commit to um, voting for Remain in the um, referendum. That said, I don't accept the post-referendum analysis by people around the Strong Green campaign that their defeat was entirely the fault of Jeremy Corbyn. I think after Labour's defeat in Scotland in the 2015 general election, following the Scottish referendum, why should Corbyn have put up with being the Tory patsy in this campaign? Why should he put himself in that position? You know, the Conservative Party were responsible for holding the referendum, so why now should uh, Jeremy Corbyn come in and save the day for them? So I think what he did in playing a slightly more low-key role was entirely logical and um, you know, in his political interests. That said, the disorganisation of the Labour in campaign did in enable the Labour leavers to actually project a more a stronger image than their numbers in Parliament um, actually deserved. And I think it was quite telling that 45% um, of Labour voters were unaware that Labour was backing Remain, and also that um, Gisela Stewart, Vote Leave's chair, and Kate Hoey, another prominent Labour Eurosceptic, were some of the most visible Labour politicians throughout the course of the campaign. And I think all this helped towards 35% of Labour voters backing Leave. But again, there's a long-term reason for uh, this success. I think it's worth noting that you know, um, Labour backers like John Mills, the businessman, who ran for many decades a group called the Labour Euro Safeguards Campaign, he kept that sort of flame of Labour Euroscepticism um, going through some quite difficult times for um, Labour Eurosceptics. So the third day I've picked is the, um, the launch of Vote Leave, or to give it its full title, the Vote Leave Take Control campaign, on the 9th of August 2015. Now, Vote Leave was launched with three core messages. Um, the first one was uh, about you know, our monies and our priorities, which led to the infamous 350 million figure, and the idea that we should use that money to fund the NHS. The second one was that leave is the safer option, and this was essential to us overcoming uh, some of the natural status quo bias in any referendum, where the change campaign is often at the, a disadvantage in a referendum. And of course, the overall slogan, take back control, which was our central slogan of the campaign, take back control of our borders, lawmaking, the money we send to the EU, the economy, trade, and it was quite significant that we included this in our title, Vote Leave, Take Control. We were criticised for that at the time, but I think it proved to be a good decision. But again, this wasn't just something dreamed up um, a year before the referendum. This was built on um, decades of um, hard work, um, most notably by uh, Dominic Cummings, who was responsible for all of our strategies, our campaign director. Um, he had done work for me at Business of Britain back in 2014 after the European elections to work out some of our strategy and messaging for the referendum. But really, his thinking on this goes back to the days when he's campaign director of um, Business of Stirling back in the late 90s, early 2000s. And also, there were two referendums worth of um, thought going into this as well. Um, Dominic's work on the North East Says No campaign against the North East Regional Assembly was an early incubator of the idea of um, looking at money in referendums with the slogan, Politicians Talk, We Pay. And of course, the work I did as the um, head of the No to AV referendum campaign uh, five years ago, where again, we used money as a central theme of the campaign, talking about the 250 million cost of changing Britain's voting system. So, this campaign was many years in the making. And the iconic red battle bus, uh, which you can see there, was only actually launched in March, but that messaging went right back to our very first leaflets put out as our launch. And I think it's worth contrasting the consistency of Vote Leave's messaging 
with um, Stronger In's messaging, where they, yes, they banged the drum on Project Fear time and time again, but they never really came up with a, um, uh, an accessible slogan to just describe their campaign. The fourth day I've picked out is the um, 9th of November, um, which was the day of the, um, the CBI um, protest. Now, the economy was always going to be the Remain campaign's uh, strong suit, and business leaders were always going to be their strongest messengers. So we needed to demonstrate on the Leave side that business was um, divided on this issue. And, you know, again, the origins of this go back um, over 10 years uh, to the Business of Sterling campaign I mentioned before, where um, Rodney Leach and uh, Dominic Cummings, who was the campaign director there, demonstrated that business was divided over Britain's membership of the um, euro. And I set up Business for Britain right after David Cameron's Bloomberg speech in January 2013 to demonstrate yet again that business was divided on the EU. And we built up um, a list of 1,500 business leaders, um, all formed into um, a regional network with regional chairmen who were capable of speaking in the media and speaking at um, events. And we did this because business leaders are, sorry, local business leaders are much more highly trusted than national business leaders. So when we were running events and debates in the course of the referendum campaign, and we used one of our local business chiefs, the chairman of the regional Business of Britain campaign, to be a spokesperson for us. They were a very effective, highly trusted um, advocate for our cause. And the reason we did this um, stunt was because we needed to demonstrate that the CBI isn't, as they claim to be, the voice of business. And we did this in several ways. First of all, we um, exposed the, the polling on which their, um, the figure they always trotted out, that 80% of businesses supported remaining in the EU. We exposed the fact that was based on, quote, dodgy polling. Uh, that's not my word. It's not uh, Vote Leave's word. It's the word of the British Polling Council when they examined how that poll was done by Yuga for the CBI. I can see John Curtis shaking his head. Um, that was the word that uh, Nick Moon used in an email back to us. Uh, that it was dodgy. So again, we were chipping away at uh, the credibility of that um, poll. And we also need to expose why they were saying, or reason why they were saying, what they were about the EU. And the CBI has received a million pounds of EU funding since 2009, accounting for 20% of their in income. So they were paid advocates for the cause, in our view. And it's notable that after exposing their polling, after the demonstration, they largely withdrew from the referendum debate. And this meant that we were using our advocates at a regional level, also unveiling some senior business leaders and entrepreneurs like Anthony Bamford and James Dyson and Tim Martin of Weatherspoons to actually make the leave case, really ramming home the point by the end of the campaign that business was divided on this issue. But again, it's worth noting that this success didn't happen overnight. You know, Lyndon Crosby has a phrase, you can't fatten a pig on market day. And the success of this operation goes right back to the creation of Business of Britain in 2013. The next date is the 20th of February 2016. And this was the date when Cameron returned with nothing from, his, from Brussels, so nothing substantial to his uh, deal. And I actually think this was probably the biggest factor in um, our victory in the referendum. Uh, when you have a situation the following day when newspapers are running the headlines, is that it? And making the comparison with Neville Chamberlain, you know that it hasn't been a successful renegotiation. And even the Guardian, the FT and the BBC um, suggested that the deal didn't amount to very much. Now, in returning with nothing, David Cameron fundamentally undermined his own position. David Cameron has suggested that we should leave the EU if we fail to get fundamental reform. And pr prior to getting the deal, uh, David Cameron repeatedly said that he ruled nothing out. 
implying that he could vote for Leave, and also saying time and time again that, of course, Britain can survive outside the EU. So when he came back with no deal, and when he then committed himself to Remain, and when he then campaigned so fervently for Remain, making all these um, dire warnings about what would happen if we leave, there was a huge inconsistency in what he said during the campaign compared to what he said prior to the deal. And I think that went down extremely badly with voters. In contrast, I think um, on the, the leave side of things, we got the uh, messaging uh, much better. If you remember, Ch uh, Business of Britain um, had the position of change or go. So we actually spend a lot of time talking about the different changes we would like to see to Britain's EU membership, but also making the case if we don't get those changes, we'd be happy for Britain to leave the EU. We've went so far as to uh, publish a thousand page magnum opus called Change or Go on the sort of changes that we needed and how Britain could survive outside the EU. So we were committed to this course of action. So when, the P when it was clear the PM was going to come back with nothing and we then changed our position to go, there was a consistency, there was a logical step in what we did, moving from uh, sort of mild Euroscepticism to saying we should leave. And that was a similar journey to what a lot of voters experienced, when after the Bloomberg speech, they were pretty much perhaps on the fence, more inclined towards wanting to vote leave, perhaps, but worried about the economy. Um, but coming down at the end of the day, having seen the lack of a deal on the leave side, so, the sixth date, and this is the second consequence of there being no deal, um, was um, Boris declaring for leave, which was a very crucial moment. And of course, not just Boris, but also all the other uh, ministers and MPs who declared for leave. I think there were six cabinet ministers at the end of the day who declared for leave, as well as over 140 Conservative MPs, which is much more than the uh, figures which the government was expecting, where they thought that about perhaps 30, at most 40, Conservative MPs would declare for leave. And the reason this was important was because it gave um, heavyweight credibility um, to the campaign. It meant that when we were talking about things like how you could spend the money on the NHS or how you could cut uh, fuel tax, this wasn't just some maverick backbencher saying it, it was people who were senior members of the government and indeed people who could be seen to be uh, potential future leaders of the Conservative Party. But the crucial one out of all of those, of course, is um, Boris. And I think Boris added to the campaign um, the charisma and the ability to reach out to voters who um, weren't engaged in conventional politics and weren't naturally attracted to the uh, Conservative Party. And the combination of Boris working with Gisela Stewart, our Labour uh, chairman, I think worked particularly well in the campaign. And it's interesting, if you look at the polling, uh, Boris was trusted to tell the truth by over twice as many voters as Cameron, 45% to 21%, and the Leave campaign was more trusted in general by 39% to 24%, their comrades' figures. So what it meant was that Vote Leave then had the right messengers delivering the, the right message to win the referendum and they worked well together as a team something you saw particularly during the tv debates which you had a very united and strong vote leave campaign team um, on the debates compared to a very divided remain team where you had bickering between angela eagle and nicola sturgeon during the course of the debate which didn't come across well on uh, tv but again i think it's worth pointing out that the uh, key ministers who came out for leave weren't sort of Johnny come lately to this debate. Boris, of course, had been writing his influential Telegraph column over many um, decades, which had a huge impact, I think. Um, Gisela became a Eurosceptic following the, um, her experience of the European Convention that led to the European Constitution and the Lisbon Treaty. And, of course, Michael Gove was the first person back in 2014, the first senior cabinet minister, to say that he would vote leave were there not to be serious uh, reform. But all this amounted to the fact that, what happened, that the campaign this year wasn't like the campaign back in 1975, which of course was characterised as being um, uh, an Enoch Powell, Michael Foote uh, campaign 
um, dominated by extremists. But of course, we should remember that it could well have been like that. And this is why the um, designation was so important. And the 13th of April was the day when Vote Leave got the designation rather than um, Grassroots Out or Leave.eu or the UKIP-based um, campaign. Now, thinking back to 1975, um, there's a famous cartoon that sums up the Leave campaign in 75. And it has um, a rabble of people marching together under the banner, um, Get Britain Out. And it includes people with flags saying Trotskyites and uh, National Front supporters, all headed up by you know, Powell, Michael Gove, Tony Benn. And the slogan underneath is Join the Professionals. So as a campaign, we did need to look um, more pro professional and have people of higher standing than back in 1975. I think we achieved that at Vote Leave. And we wouldn't have achieved that had we been one united campaign. I think that UKIP probably has a ceiling of about 30% support in the electorate. That's roughly what it got, I think, in the 20, 2014 European elections. And one crucial fact about the swing voters in this referendum was that they didn't want to feel they were voting UKIP by voting Leave. And that's why it was essential that Vote Leave was a non-UKIP-based campaign. And this strategy went right back to Business of Britain, where we didn't have any um, UKIP people associated with the campaign. We always kept as a non-UKIP, and really non-political, uh, party political based uh, campaign. As a consequence of having um, the separate Vote Leave campaign and not being one amalgamated campaign, and people were saying time and time again that we should join up and be one campaign, we were able to build a much broader based coalition than we otherwise would have been able to. And I'm thinking of some of the groups that we set up during the course of the referendum, groups like um, Out and Proud, uh, Students for Britain, Liberal Leave, Green Leaves, and the many sort of four Britain groups inspired by Business for Britain, Women for Britain, Muslims for Britain, Lawyers for Britain, Veterans for Britain, even Vapors for Britain. And had we had just one campaign, a lot of these disparate groups wouldn't have joined in but they felt comfortable in being part of a non-UKIP-based, more mainstream uh, campaign. And I think our decision not to join up uh, with UKIP has been vindicated by the final result. The next day, the 22nd of April, um, this is the day of Obama's uh, ill-judged intervention in the debate. Now, when David Cameron didn't get the bounce he, he expected when he came back with his deal, he was expected to get a bounce of between 10 or 15 points, but of course he didn't get that bounce. He was hoping to get a bounce when um, Obama um, entered the fray, um, but it didn't happen. Uh, in the event, it turned out to be um, a win, not for the Remain side, but a win for the Leave side. And Obama, on his trip, of course, said the fateful words that Britain would be sent to the back of the queue uh, for a trade deal with the US. Uh, were we to vote for leave. And I think that may mark quite a uh, key point. When voters turned against the uh, rather sort of patronising attempts by the global elite to bully and browbeat them into voting remain. Think of people involved in the, the Davos club, you know, people like Christine Lagarde. Think of the celebrities, Kira Knightley, Bob Geldof. Think of the experts in general the IMF, the OECD, the CBI, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, all of these people wading into the debate. Now, this played right into Vote Leave's, um, one of the key campaign themes of wrong then, wrong now, with that very strong anti-establishment message. And one thing we said time and time again was that the very people who were saying it would be terrible if we left the EU were the same people who were saying it would be terrible if we didn't join the Euro. And we said they were wrong then, wrong now. They're wrong about Britain's membership of the Euro, and they're now wrong about the case about leave. And I think it's um, worth pointing out that, of course, a lot of Project Fair hasn't come to pass. So I think we've been proved right on that. But back to Obama. Um, I think it's quite telling that the week afterwards, um, 
showed an uptick in support for leave. So I think actually the intervention of um, global leaders like Obama and experts generally actually moved things in our favour. So it played into the anti-establishment nature of our campaign. Migration. Um, so the 12th of May um, was the day when the ONS um, published their uh, figures on the number of national insurance numbers given out to EU migrants. And uh, they published the fact that I think it was 2.25 million national insurance numbers were given out over the previous five years, despite there being only 1 million uh, migrants in the official migration figures. And this was a key point of the campaign with lots of um, newspaper coverage. Now, for the Remain campaign, they should always have known that migration was going to be their weak flank, just like the economy was always going to be the weak flank for the Leave campaign. But despite this, they had no answers um, on the subject of migration, with Cameron sticking with his um, soundbite that he wanted to reduce migration to the tens of um, thousands, despite net migration being uh, roughly 300,000 a year. And the message of vote leave, of taking back control of our borders, I think really resonated with the public, um, who were frankly sick and tired of the uncontrolled migration from the EU. And this factor really goes back to 2004, of course the year when you had the um, expansion of the EU to include some of the East European um, member states. And it's from that point when Tony Blair predicted that only a few, um, a few thousand people would come, come to the UK, um, that people felt a growing resentment of the very high levels of migration from other um, EU uh, member states. And this was not only a question of the migration, it was also a question of being lied to um, by politicians. So this, of course, was a key part in the referendum. The key challenge I put out to people on the Remain side is why didn't they anticipate this? You know, we anticipated that the economy would be our weak flank. We prepared for that. I didn't see any real effort by people on the Remain side to anticipate that their weak flank in the referendum would be migration and to do anything to mitigate people's fears in this area. So the 14th of June, um, that was the day when the sun came out in favour of um, Brexit. Now, in contrast with the broadcast media, um, which I would say overall probably has slightly remain bias overall, um, the print media was very much split. Um, of course, you had the FT, the Times, the Guardian, the Mail on Sunday, and the Mirror backing Remain. But you had the more widely read newspapers backing Leave, the Sunday Times, uh, the Telegraph, the Mail, the Express, and the Sun. And this is a dramatic change from 1975, when I think it was just the Morning Star and the Spectator who backed the Leave campaign. But I think it would be a mistake to have some sort of narrative that Leave victories was, was down to um, the Tory press or down to the newspaper pr proprietors who owned the, the key uh, Tory newspapers. Um, I think that successive governments, not just David Cameron, but also Gordon Brown, Tony Blair, John Major, all need to shoulder a certain amount of blame for this. And let me just explain my reasoning. I was speaking to um, one of the ambassadors um, recently about um, Leave's victory, and he gave me an explanation as follows. He said, you can't drip poison into a well and then expect voters to drink from it. And over many years, the sort of language used by prime ministers when addressing the EU wasn't the language of how the EU was um, a good thing for the UK or a positive thing. It was language about how they were going to go into battle, um, how they were going to block new measures, how they were winning crucial victories over the EU. So this is a very adversarial form of language when addressing the EU. So you can't expect your narrative one day to be very adversarial and then expect people to vote to remain in the EU uh, the next day. All successful comm strategies aren't just executed over a matter of months, they're executed over a matter of years. 
the next day, um, the 15th of June, this was the day of um, George Osborne's um, punishment budget, which was frankly sort of left in um, tatters. And this is really the peak of um, Project Fear. It was about a week out from the um, referendum. This is when he threatened to hike taxes and slash benefits if the UK voted leave. Now, we got wind of the announcement about uh, 24 hours beforehand. Uh, so it gave us 24 hours to actually gather a list of 60 Conservative MPs um, who, who said that, who signed a letter saying they'd vote against this punishment budget, a letter which we released just as George Osborne was going on the Today programme to um, announce it. And this is perhaps the, the peak of the uh, Vote Leave uh, campaign. And it was also the culmination, the punishment budget, of uh, a long-running campaign by the Treasury, um, you know, which people dubbed um, Project Fear. And I think Project Fear was really actually undermined by the um, hysterical nature of some of the warnings, which frankly sort of flew in the face of um, voters or more common sense on these issues. Uh, voters found the key vote leave messages, about 350 million, much more credible than the key treasury messages about how leaving the EU would cost each household £4,300. And also they found the leave campaign to be much more positive than the Remain campaign was. So I don't think Project Fear helped in this situation. And I think basically the strategy, of course, the Remain campaign went back to the Scottish referendum when um, Andrew Cooper, who was a strategist for the Remain campaign, was also the strategist for the um, pro-unionists, the Better Together campaign in Scotland. And of course, they'd had a project fear in the Scottish referendum. And they interpreted that as being a great success because they won that referendum. But actually, as a campaigner, in some ways, you could say that Alex Salmond won the Scottish referendum in the sense that he went up from 25% support to 45% support on the day. So the momentum was hit with him. So I think the misinterpretation of Scotland led to a crucial strategic mistake when it came to the EU referendum. So the 23rd of June, um, Independence Day. Um, despite going into referendum day, uh, roughly 5% behind in the polls, Leave managed to win by 4%. Now, we were always confident that we were going to um, outperform the polling expectations for a number of reasons. Um, the first one was that um, Leave voters were more likely to turn out than Remain voters. Um, they're much more enthusiastic about um, voting leave. And in our turnout models, rather than asking people they're likely to vote, we asked them um, how enthusiastic they were about the um, referendum. So we also thought that our guys more likely to turn out. I also think that we had a better organised um, ground campaign. Of the um, 650 constituencies, 641 had um, volunteer uh, coordinators. Uh, we delivered over 50 million leaflets, um, including dawn, raid, dawn raids on polling day. And that was quite apart from the leaflets put out by um, Grassroots Out and Leaf.eu and UKIP. So many more leaflets were delivered on uh, our side. And this was really building on a grassroots movement that in some ways went right back to the um, referendum party in the mid-1990s. I thought it was quite telling that um, in Lambeth, one of the boroughs that voted most heavily for Remain, where I actually live in Brixton, um, every Saturday I would go out campaigning with uh, some of the local um, organisers there. And we always had at least a dozen people going right back to um, September of last year, campaigning every weekend in Brixton, in Streatham, in Lambeth more generally, for leave. And I never really saw um, much more activity than that on the Remain side of things. So the fact that leave was actually matching the Remain side in a part of the country which was very heavily Remain, I can bet you bottom dollar that the Remain side weren't campaigning as heavily as uh, the leave side in Clacton or in other parts of the country that voted leave. I think we also had a more successful um, social media campaign um, on the Leave side. 
um, both what we did at Vote Leave and also what was done more generally on the Leave side, which much, much higher engagement rates with our material online, much more um, sharing going on, much more retweeting going on, which is surprising in a sense given the social demographic of people who use um, social media. So that suggests we were actually winning on the uh, social media front. And of course, all this fed into us having a better um, get out the vote operation on the day, which is crucial to um, any campaign. And Vote Leave had built, I think, quite a successful model in identifying right down to street level, which are which were likely to be our more um, uh, more rich areas to target. Um, and this this became crucial on the day because we were able to direct activists to the best parts of the country. That's actually 12 days. I'm going to cheat and have a 13th day um, because um, Anna and asked me to also talk about. Uh, what Brexit means. Now, this will be very, very short, don't worry, uh, because I've run out of time. Um, and I'll perhaps talk more about this in the Q&A if you're interested. I think I'll just restrict myself to two observations. I think campaigners on both sides in the referendum were very, very clear that leaving meant leaving the single market. People on the Remain side accused the Leave side time and time again of wanting to leave the single market. But also on the Leave side, we were quite open in acknowledging the fact that Leave would be leaving the single market. So I think that debate should really be parked. I think the second observation would be that in setting up a department for international trade, I think it's really only meaningful if Britain actually leaves the customs union. So when people say, what does Brexit mean? Um, to me, those two factors point quite clearly to being, a, to being my words, a, a clean Brexit. So the idea we're going to go down some sort of Norway-style um, option, um, I think, is for the birds. In conclusion, um, You'll all be familiar with the phrase that victory has a hundred fathers and defeat is an orphan. And I think this is certainly the case in the um, referendum, in the EU referendum. And each of the dates I picked was a key win for the Leave campaign. But I hope I've been able to demonstrate that each of those days was actually grounded in campaigning over many years, if not um, decades, of activity. And I think much of the analysis of the referendum uh, put out uh, immediately after has really just focused on the short-term referendum campaign itself, the short campaign, if you like. And I think any serious analysis, perhaps by any budding PhD students in the room, needs to actually really look at all of these long-term factors that led to Britain leaving the EU on the 23rd of June. Thank you very much.